Welcome to you all. Welcome to this Constitution Unit seminar. My name is Alan Rennick. I'm the Deputy Director of the Constitution Unit and I'm your chair for today. The title of this seminar is The Brown Commission, What Next? And the subject is, of course, the report of the Labour Party's Commission on the UK's Future, chaired by Gordon Brown, which published its recommendations for a range of major constitutional changes in December. Um, the, record, the report's core aim is decentralisation of power, and it has proposals on further devolution of powers to Scotland and Wales, greater decentralisation within England, as well as other parts of the UK, greater entrenchment of a range of constitutional principles, the replacement of the House of Lords with an elected assembly of the nations and regions, and strengthening of the standard system. Um, Keir Starmer has welcomed and broadly endorsed the report and has said that the Labour Party will now consult on the proposals before announcing its own detailed plans. So we have lots of questions to ask. What should we make of the proposals that are in the report? What does it leave out? Uh, could the proposals be practically implemented? And if so, how might this be done? And to help us address these questions, we have a panel of three wonderful speakers. Akash Pown is Senior Fellow at the Institute for Government and an expert on devolution. Aileen McHarg is Professor of Public Law and Human Rights Law at, uh, Human Rights, sorry, at Durham University and an expert on constitutional law, particularly in relation to devolution. And Meg Russell is Professor of British and Comparative Politics and Director of the Constitution Unit here at UCL and an expert on the House of Lords and other second chambers. Each speaker will offer opening remarks of about five minutes and then we'll then have a panel discussion and finally we'll open the floor to your questions. Questions will be gathered today by Tom Fleming whom you can see on your screens. So if you have a question that you'd like to put to the panel please write it in the Q&A function that you can see on Zoom rather than the chat function. Uh, Tom will select a broad range of questions and ask the person who submitted each question to unmute themselves and ask it to the panel. If you'd rather not ask your question yourself, please let Tom know when you submit your question and he will ask it on your behalf. Final note before I hand over to our first speaker, the whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded and will be posted online on the Constitution Unit website, our YouTube channel and our podcast after the event. So if you speak, you will be heard on the recording. If you don't speak, you will not be heard. Um, so do just take that into account. And with that, I shall hand straight over to our first speaker, who will be Akash. Welcome, Akash. Thank you, Alan, and uh, good afternoon. Um, it's uh, great to be taking part in this, in this session. You didn't mention in my introduction, Alan, but uh, for those who don't know, um, aside from being senior fellow at the Institute for Government, um, I, I started my career as a researcher at the Constitution Unit and um, worked for some years with with Meg and and Robert Hazel as previous directors. It's, it's a real pleasure to be to be back, albeit virtually, um, after a few years. <laughs> so thank you for 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 involving me. Um, so I've been asked to speak for a few minutes about the devolution union territorial aspects of the Brown Report. Um, I certainly won't be able to do justice to the full detail of the proposals in this area since fixing the territorial constitution as as you mentioned Alan is really is a, a central theme or, or maybe the big theme of the report and, and that was um, explicit at the time that the commission was was first established back in December 2020. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we'll get stuck into more detailed discussion after the um, initial remarks from 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 myself and and Megan Aileen. But um, I just will pull out some of the central uh, I, the big ideas that um, are in the in the Brown package and uh, make some commentary as to how they all fit together and then uh, really look forward to the conversation. So, um, I mean, first of all, as, as mentioned, um, there was a strong commitment in the report to further devolution within England, particularly to Metro Mayor's existing combined authorities in a slightly vaguer sense to, to local government more generally. The premise of the report is that political centralization is linked, causally linked, 
with uh, regional economic inequality. And so devolution is necessary as, as part of the solution to that problem. So, so the political constitutional analysis is very much li linked to um, an, an economic um, analysis of, of, of the problems facing uh, parts of England, I suppose, particularly in, in, in the north and other left behind areas, to use that phrase. Um, so what would devolution look like in practice if the if the brown uh, package were to be were to be implemented by a future Labour government? Well, the report sets out some specific proposals for for devolution of powers, particularly in areas linked to regional economic development, transport, skills, infrastructure, net zero delivery, things like electric vehicle networks, uh, retrofitting of housing, um, along with a commitment to funding reform in which um, devolved and, and local government would be given longer term certainty over budgets and less micromanagement from the centre, less competitive funding bids, uh, bid, bid, bidding uh, processes and that kind of thing. And, you know, this is all sensible. It's in line with IFG analysis and lots of other people's conclusions of um, how the powers of, of subnational government in England, particularly over economic development, could be expanded. Um, but I think what is striking is how much common ground there is actually with the government's uh, leveling up strategy, which, you know, uses very similar language. It rests on similar analysis of the link between the economic and, and, and political problems. So it's not clear that this is going to be a big dividing line at the election. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe it means we'll have more policy continuity rather than a new government ripping up its predecessor's achievements, which we see far too often, frankly, in, in British politics. So, you know, as, as far as that goes, it's it's welcome. And there are also some signs Labour might go further. Uh, for instance, there's a proposal specifically to devolve uh, responsibility for job centres and employment support and some other things as well, which, which could be quite a uh, significant change. Um, so yeah, so 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 that's the sort of proposals as far as specific powers are concerned. But the other thing I wanted to note about the proposals for England is that there really isn't a clear path set out in this report, or indeed in recent speeches by like either Keir Starmer or Lisa Nandy this week about how devolution will be extended across the still about half of the country, or more than half. Um, that currently has no devolved powers. Both gov government and Labour say it should be extended, but what actually is being proposed? Um, the Brown report, on the one hand, criticises the government for what it um, describes as an ad, ad hoc patchwork approach to devolution. But then what it proposes, or what it argues rather, is there should be no top-down imposition on, of any particular model, nor any prescriptive geography of devolution. Um, instead, it talks about encouraging bottom-up formation of local partnerships who would come forward with their own proposals for what should be devolved and, and on what the governance arrangement should be, which Brown has suggested could be put to Parliament via um, local bills that would then uh, be be considered as private legislation in Westminster. So I think what's clear, and Lisa Nandy used this phrase in a speech this week um, at the Institute for Government, quick plug, uh, is that uh, Labour would be comfortable with messiness uh, in, in terms of how England is government, governed. And, you know, that's maybe understandable, pragmatic, certainly. Labour back in post-97 periods, uh, tried to impose a standard system of regional assemblies. Um, people involved in this debate for a long time will remember, of course, um, that collapsed and 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 was abandoned. So, you know, there's 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 a there's a there's a recognition that you can't just have a one size fits all model. I understand that, but whether therefore this offers the basis for a stable new settlement for England. Um, I think is debatable. Um, so I've probably already used up most of my time. Um, I was going to say a bit about Scotland and Wales as well. Alan, would you rather I hold off on that for Q&A? 
you want to give us just a couple of headlines uh, to get, a, get us thinking about those issues and then we'll, we'll go into them in further detail in the Q&A? Sure, yeah. I mean, as I said at the start, there's just way too much in this report to, <laughs> to do justice to. Um, OK, sure. So, I mean, I suppose just my headline thoughts are, um, well, first of all, there's a slightly odd phrase used in a couple of places in the report that the UK is the most centralised country in Europe. But I think they really mean England. And it's just one of these kind of slightly unfortunate slips of language between England, Britain and UK. Um, because, as I've said, most of the specific recommendations for devolution are about England. As far as Scotland, Wales are concerned, there's some ideas, again, job centre devolution, uh, Wales will get control of youth justice and probation, but it's quite cautious in, in that regard. There's no sort of fiscal devolution. There's no full devolution proposed of policing and justice to Wales as the Welsh government wants. Uh, instead, of course, what they proposed, which I have no doubt Meg and Aileen will both be talking about, is quite an interesting, innovative idea of how you might offer protection, constitutional protection or entrenchment to the devolution settlements by giving the reformed upper chamber the power to veto legislation that relates to devolved matters, which doesn't have devolved consent. And, and you know, I think this is an attempt to solve a genuine problem, a uh, genuine issue, you know, in that since Brexit, we've seen on a number of occasions legislation passed by Westminster that falls within the scope of the Sewell Convention, so normally requires uh, or is, 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 is passed only with devolved consent, but has not had consent and, and, and has done, they've done some quite controversial things, for example, through the UK Internal Market Act and uh, Subsidy Control Act as well, um, that um, if this new system were, were passed, couldn't happen. Although, as we were just talking about this before, off air, Brown and Labour do not seem to be suggesting they'd repeal that controversial legislation, but they do seem to be suggesting they'd bind their own hands in future or potentially do so. I mean, I think there's some big questions about how that reform would work and whether giving the power to a new reform chamber to veto certain legislation is the same or would be the same as creating a, a, an expectation or convention that that power would be used. And that, I think, is quite hard to predict. Uh, we don't know the, how the new upper chamber would be elected or anything, but might it actually feel less um, willing to be assertive and, and block the will of the elected lower chamber than the current lords do? That's an interesting question. I'm sure Meg will have thoughts on that. I will that's pause a, there. Great, thank you, Akash. Lots of great questions that we will explore further, I have no doubt. Fantastic start there. Aileen, over to you. Thanks very much, and thanks for, for inviting me as well. Uh, so I've been asked to uh, address the legal aspects of the proposals, and these fall into two main groups. So first of all, there are proposals in various areas, uh, primarily the territorial constitution, but also in respect of social and economic rights, and in relation to ethics and standards in central government, uh, various proposals to introduce new statutory rules or new forms of statutory regulation, which basically continues the trend towards legalization of the constitution, which was begun under the Blair and Brown governments. So that's the first sort of legal theme. The second one um, is, as Akash has already uh, uh, hinted at, there is, um, an overlapping, not entirely coterminous, but overlapping proposal to secure a degree of entrenchment for key constitutional proposals, but without abandoning parliamentary sovereignty. So I'll say something very brief about each of these things. I'll concentrate on the territorial constitution, but I'm happy to come back to the other aspects in Q&A. So on the first theme, um, there are various proposals for new legal duties in relation to the territorial constitution. This is in addition to, to new powers. These are new kind of legal principles of general application. And some of these I think are welcome, um, but others I'm a bit more skeptical about. So two things that I think are welcome are first of all, a proposal to put the machinery of, of intergovernmental relations on a statutory basis for the first time. It's always been a non-statutory uh, set of arrangements so far. Uh, and secondly, um, as Akash said, that there is a kind of 
uh, a proposal to have another go at putting the Seoul Convention on a proper statutory basis. Now, these are things that are welcome, I think, because they do address key weaknesses in the territorial constitution currently, queer informality in our arrangements, a political basis to our constitution has really ultimately worked to the advantage of the UK institutions. So it, in these areas, I think there is a case for legal intervention to try to level the playing field between the UK and both governments. But there are various other proposals in this area as well. Um, a statutory statement of the political, social and economic purposes of the UK, a statutory principle of subsidiarity, uh, a solidarity clause, um, a duty of sincere cooperation on different levels of government, constitutional obligation to rebalance the economy, um, and a constitutional requirement to respect the autonomy of local government in, in England. Now, as I see it, there are three main problems with these proposals. Firstly, an almost complete absence of detail about how they will work in practice and how they'll interact with one another. So just to take one example, Subsidiarity and the solidarity clause would seem to pull in entirely opposite directions. Another example, how on earth would you enforce a constitutional duty to rebalance the economy, given that ministers are not completely in control of, 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 of that, that issue? Second problem, I really worry about adding complexity to what is already a highly complex legal environment for devolution. Uh, so this statutory statement of the purposes of the UK, for example, is not supposed to be directly enforceable, but may be given an interpretive role. Uh, but if so, that would completely change the way in which the courts currently uh, approach disputes about the boundaries of devolved competence. So again, how would that work? And, and would that simplify anything or just com uh, make it more complex? And also, as Akash has said already, it does seem a bit detached from some of the problems that are causing concern on the ground in relation to devolution. So one of the purposes of the UK uh, is, is supposed to be about providing a single market, but it says, the, the report says nothing at all about how the Northern Ireland Protocol would fit into that. Um, as Akash said, no proposals to, uh, to, to revisit the highly problematic UK Internal Market Act. Um, moving to entrenchment, uh, as Akash said, again, there is an innovative proposal here to enhance the protection to be offered to key principles of the territorial constitution. So that would be the permanence of the developed institutions and the Sewell Convention, alongside other uh, constitutional statutes, although the precise scope of this mechanism is not, is not yet determined. This will be a key function for the remodeled um, second chamber. And it's modelled on the enhanced protection that is currently offered under the Parliament Acts to bills to prolong the, the life of Parliament. Under the Parliament Acts, uh, bills which, which would pro prolong the, the life of Parliament are uniquely ones which must gain the consent of the House of Lords. So in other words, uh, the, the idea would be in relation to these new protected provisions, it would be impossible for that the House of Commons to act unilaterally to amend and repeal these provisions. I may will say more about the feasibility of reform of the House of Lords uh, in general, no doubt. I just want to make three uh, quick points about how this would operate as an entrenchment mechanism. So again, lack of detail, uh, which provisions will be included and how exactly it'll work, apparently to be sub subject to some kind of override mechanism but no, um, no concrete proposals there. Secondly, as a form of entrenchment, it is pre pretty weak. It will depend upon the members of the second chamber being willing to exercise their veto power. Uh, it will only attach to certain constitutional statutes. And insofar as our constitutional arrangements are, are contained in common law, for instance, or general principles, they won't come within the scope of this mechanism. And since uh, the proposal is to remove the House of Lords veto completely, it, or even a delaying power to, to be removed in relation to ordinary legislation, actually you might end up with a weaker constitutional guardian rather than a stronger one. And then my final point, in relation to the ability of the Second Chamber to protect the territorial con constitution, 
Home position is absolutely key. Uh, unless the devolved nations are represented um, at a greater proportion than their population share would, would suggest, this will offer no guarantees at all because uh, the second chamber, um, you, you know, the, 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 their interests will be as easily overridden in the second chamber as they currently are in the House of Commons. And again, no recognition in this report that that is even an issue. Uh, there's very little said about composition. It's supposed to be on a regional basis, uh, but that's all. But there's no recognition of this need, which you find commonly in um, in federal system for a different principle of election, which is not related to population share. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, Ellie. Thank you so much. Uh, lots of things there that I'm sure Meg will want to build on further. So Meg, straight over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me start by joining Alan in thanking the other two speakers for joining our panel today and to everybody else for being here. Um, it was very appropriate to begin this event by talking about devolution because that's, as has been said, what the Brown Report is primarily about. Um, around 110 of its 150 pages are devoted to devolution and regional inequalities. And in contrast, under 10 pages are devoted to Lords reform. So it's striking that most of the media coverage about it focused on the abolition of the House of Lords. Even more so, given that the report doesn't actually propose abolition. Instead, as has been said, like many other reports before it, it advocates changing the Lords into an elected second chamber. Those earlier proposals, when made by previous Labour governments and by the Cameron Clegg coalition, were never labelled abolition. I'm not particularly blaming the media here because this line seems to have been briefed by the Brown Commission itself. This public focus on the Lords seems to me a bit of a shame, but I guess it occurred for two reasons. Because the proposals were perhaps seen as clearer and simpler than those on devolution, and because it was thought they'd be popular. But abolition of the Lords is a catchy line. But in fact, Lords reform is notoriously difficult and complex, as many listening will know. The Brown Report itself notes that fundamental reform of the Lords has been the official goal of successive governments for a century. And it quotes the famous words from the 1911 Parliament Act that introducing a second chamber constituted on a popular basis cannot immediately be brought into operation. Anyone quoting those words should have serious pause to, for thought as to why it's taken so long. The report proposes, as has been said, an assembly of the nations and regions, a promise that's appeared in several recent Labour manifestos, but never with much detail. So Brown tries to flesh this out. In one respect, this goes further than earlier proposals in suggesting that the second chamber might do new and different things. These include overseeing UK intergovernmental bodies, monitoring regional economic inequalities, taking a lead in scrutinizing the new category of local legislation that Akash referred to, and as Aileen just discussed, safeguarding the constitution by having veto powers over a defined set of constitutional statutes. These proposals are quite radical and the aspirations seem good, but the devil would be in the detail in terms of whether and how they could be made to work. There are further important questions about the existing powers of the Lords, where the Commission suggests that the new second chamber should not inherit the present Lords power of delaying all legislation. Aileen just referred to this. I find this line slightly worrying, and it's an idea which certainly needs careful consideration. As the report itself says, the Lord's scrutiny of legislation can be more thorough and effective than the Commons, and it rarely uses its delay powers to the full. But the fact that they're there helps to ensure the government takes it seriously. The purpose of this plan is clearly to allay fears that a new elected second chamber would prove more assertive than the current appointed chamber. That crucially links powers and functions to composition. On composition, the Brown proposals are, in contrast, distinctly vague. Various proposals over the past 25 years have laid out plans for elections to the second chamber, but Brown doesn't, didn't, doesn't pick these up. Instead, it's stated that the precise composition and method of election are matters for consultation. The report suggests that the chamber might have around 200 members, markedly smaller than previous proposals, but it doesn't set out an electoral system, electoral boundaries, terms of office, or whether all the members of the second chamber would be elected at once. The sharing of seats between areas, as Aileen just emphasized, would be crucial. 
And unless this was coupled with some kind of procedural innovation, it's quite unlikely to leave the smaller nations feeling protected in the way the Brown Report hopes. Again, the devil's in the detail here, and there's potentially plenty to argue over. Beyond powers, another thing that people might like to hold on to from the current system is the independent crossbench members, currently chosen by the House of Lords Appointments Commission. Previous proposals have uniformly suggested that 20% of seats should continue to be reserved for this group. The Brown Commission didn't, but it was clearly split on this point, with one dissenting voice noted in a footnote. Again, this presents plenty of scope for arguments. In summary, the Brown Report is far from a blueprint for Lords reform, and there should perhaps have been more reflection on just why so many ambitious proposals for reform since 1911 have consistently failed. A quick spoiler here, it wasn't because they were blocked by the Lords, they generally disintegrated in the Commons. Notably, in describing the House of Lords as indefensible, the report cites various things, including the chamber's ballooning size and connectedly the prime minister's unfettered appointing power. These are things on which there's pretty general agreement with a recent constitution unit poll finding well under 10% of the public backing the status quo on either of these points. To conclude, while the Brown report is likely to be argued over and consulted on for some time, just a tiny bit of political effort could deal with what it itself identifies as the most urgent problems with the Lords. In 1997, Labour achieved important change through a two-stage approach to Lords reform, even though the second stage was never reached. This time, the same approach would be wise, a first stage to limit the Chamber's size, regulate appointments and deal with the remaining hereditary peers would deal with the worst problems of the Lords and could offer the party an easy win. Thank you. Great stuff, Meg. Many, many thanks. Uh, so we've heard a huge amount there. There's clearly uh, an, an enormous amount in this report and we've uh, uh, raised many of the themes. No doubt many of you will have questions. <clears throat> so if you haven't yet put your question in the Q&A, uh, now is the time to do so. I can see there are already some juicy ones in there, um, but it would be great to have some more uh, in there as well. Um, <clears throat> while you're doing that, uh, let me ask some uh, questions to the panel. And I guess given that this is such a big report and such it covers such broad terrain, it's useful just to think a little bit about the big picture here. And one of the one of the things that I found quite interesting and welcome about this report is that it does talk quite a lot about sort of underlying drivers and motivations for thinking about the constitutional structures. So as Akash mentioned, there's quite a lot in the report about economic inequality, and one of the key drivers for the report is a desire to overcome economic inequality and a perception that um, uh, governance structures and constitutional structures are part of what is uh, leading to uh, very high levels of inequality between parts of the UK at, at present. Um, and I guess there are maybe two other core drivers to all of this as well. One is um, a desire to overcome the alienation of uh, the public, members of the public from politics and from our democratic system. And then the third one, I guess, is an attempt to keep Scotland in the union, fundamentally. Um, and I guess my question here is, are these the correct drivers, that, or are these the most important drivers that we should be focusing on when we're thinking about possible constitutional reforms, democratic reforms in, in the UK? Is, is the focus here right overall uh, to start off with? And given that focus, are these the are the are, are these the, the the proposals in the right areas, or are there some things that are just totally missing from this report that we need also to consider? So it's a slightly big uh, quest, question to start with, but I think it is useful to um, begin with the big picture, as I said. Um, Aileen, do you want to go first on this round? Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so the, the, the three things that you mentioned, I mean, I, I suppose as a constitutional lawyer, the one that looks oddest is, is the um, economic uh, inequality driver. Although, you know, going back to, to Gordon Brown's own sort of previous um, uh, recommend, uh, proposals when he was prime minister, he, the, the governance of, of Britain, green paper that he published, you know, the, the link between 
the constitution and the economy was was there already, although, although um, much more muted. And I guess if you go back you know, as far as the 70s, you would see um, a, a link being drawn between the UK's dysfunctional constitutional arrangements and its dysfunctional um, economy. Um, in terms of the desire to keep Scotland in the Union, the obvious thing that's then missing from, from the report is anything at all about the fundamental nature of the Union and the circumstances in which it can be dissolved. So there's nothing at all about uh, secession rights. And that, you know, again, that contributes to that sense that I said it seems kind of disengaged from the key issues that are being talked about on the ground. But also I think it, it it's a mistake because it, it means that the report fails to address the question of what, what is the fundamental nature of the territorial constitution. It talks about what the UK is for. It's for, you know, common security and, and, and economic prosperity and social and economic rights and so on, but not what it is. Is it a voluntary union or is it... Is it a permanent arrangement? Is it really a unitary state? Is it some kind of place a federal state? I think that's a mistake not to have not to have addressed that, that question because it won't go away. It will continue to 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 rumble on. Interesting. Thank you. Um, it, I, I can't resist uh, advertising that the next Constitution Unit SEP seminar, not yet publicly advertised, but it will be on exactly this question: What does it mean for the UK to be a voluntary union? Uh, really important question. Meg, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I'll steer away from the devolution stuff and, and say something else overarching, which is partly about content and partly about process, I suppose, um, which is that I don't think the report puts adequate emphasis on the importance of stability in a constitution and on broad agreement for reform. Um, I mean, certainly in the Lord's reform area, there's there's no reference to that. And in general, these are very wide ranging reforms. I mean, in a way, Alan would slap me uh, if I didn't mention some of this kind of stuff, because in terms of process for constitutional change, there's no real discussion as to how discussion is going to take place. There's no there's no blueprint for the consultation, which is no longer the, the matter, a matter for the Brown Commission. That's for the Labour Party. The Labour Party hasn't set that out, but the Brown Commission didn't suggest anything. Um, and there's nothing really on in, in engaging the public. And certainly, you know, this is a lot of this stuff is highly contentious. And if we're going to come up with a stable constitutional settlement, there needs to be lots of discussion with people at the devolved level in particular, but also perhaps talking to um, people who are familiar with other uh, decentralized systems elsewhere. Um, and then with the wider public to come up with plans which are going to be lasting and not just seem to be something pursued in the interests of the governing party. The idea with this package of proposals is that it should all be able to be implemented by the Labour Party quite quickly. And I'm afraid, I think, if that's in tension with stability, and I think stability is very important, and therefore, uh, quick implementation is simply not going to be possible because the Labour Party in opposition won't be able to do the kind of consultation that's necessary. It just doesn't have the resources and people won't engage with an opposition party in the way they would engage with the public. So I think a big thing that's missing is the process question. You know, should there be citizens assemblies on this? Should it be an all UK citizens assembly? Do you hold different ones in the different parts of the country? What should its scope be? Um, if you're doing, if you're consulting on the second chamber, you can't do that independently of consulting on the devolution settlement itself. And, you know, when it comes to the boundaries, as Akash was saying, there's this problem that there's no top down solution. So we don't know what the boundaries for England would be. All of this stuff is very enmeshed and complicated. And you can't just implement one bit without consulting the public on their opinions on all of it. So process needs consideration. So I'll be really interested to hear um, the thoughts of Akash and Alien on process as well, because I agree that this is very important. Um, but before we get there, Akash, do you want to um, offer thoughts on, on, on the question that Meg expertly sidestepped there about the, um, the drivers of, of, of these proposals and whether the, the, this agenda in terms of economic reform, mm. tackling political alienation, keeping Scotland in the union, whether the, these are the right drivers and whether these policies are, are, are kind of addressed towards those. Yeah, sure. So um, 
I mean, on the on the nature of the union question that Aileen was talking about, particularly, um, I mean, clearly the, the the report simply ducks the issue entirely of what does a voluntary union mean? Is there a right to self determination? In what circumstances is there a right for Scotland or indeed um, other other of the UK nations to, to 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 leave? And we know that that's a politically hugely um, toxic subject really for for Labour to go near um, <clears throat> and uh, memories of the 2015 election campaign still run deep I'm sure in Labour the the conservative narrative of future Labour government being in the pocket of Alex Salmond and and that kind of thing um, so yes they're avoiding that uh, for for kind of obvious reasons I mean on on, on the other drivers that you identified I mean I think <clears throat> You know, the, the, the economic case for some of this sort of um, regional devolution of the kind of functions I was talking about um, over transport and skills and infrastructure and housing and planning and those kind of things is, is quite good, actually, in that, you know, it is it is notable that England lacks a intermediate tier across most of the country or it certainly has done until until pretty recently um and that is the tier at which some of these functions are i think best dealt with you know it's, this is not an original point but if you're trying to run the public transport system in the greater manchester region you cannot do it simply within the city of manchester at the local authority level because the the tram lines and, and buses and so on span across the wider metropolitan agglomeration so there is that and and likewise the labor market the housing market those kind of things you know they they, they there's a functional economic geography kind of rationale for why you want some of these functions to be held at, at that regional level local authorities are too small central government is too distant and lacks the lacks the knowledge and lacks the ability to join up across silos and so on so yeah i mean i think on that front it it, it does make sense and that's why there is that commonality that i noted with a lot of what the government's been talking about as well or maybe with some you know differences of nuance and so on and then just quickly on the other point you made before that about trust and disengagement with democracy um yes i mean this is a this is a kind of strong argument i think made in the brown report that um well what it comes down to is local leaders are often more trusted seen as 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 you know closer to the people more likely to act as effective champions for their for their areas than ministers in in distant westminster and whitehall um, and therefore, there is likely to be a degree of public support for, um, yeah, stronger, stronger local leadership, stronger, stronger local champions. And I think there's some evidence for that. It's not to say that Metro mayors are in all cases, you know, widely, uh, widely loved or, or, or seen as, as particularly important in, in their regions. But, uh, you know, in, in, in some places, they've certainly, I think, had a quite positive impact and, and people would not necessarily want to reverse those changes. So, yes, I, I kind of see the logic of that as well. OK, great. Um, Aileen, what are your thoughts on this process question that, that Meg has raised? It was quite stri striking when you were speaking. I, I, I kept writing down that your lack of detail was a phrase that you used several times in relation to quite a lot of the proposals. What do you think the process should be for working out a, a programme of actual reforms that Labour could implement? Well, I think uh, there's sort of two elements to... to... The process, isn't there? The, the one is is to address that question of of, of detail, um, which requires some you know serious expert input, um, as as well as uh, broader consultation. And then the, the second part of the process is getting uh, consent, which, as as Ben's really said, is is necessary for stability and at that point you need you need at the very least uh cross-party buy-in um but ideally you would have um some uh, some some more um 
popular non policy based process as well. Now, in previous, in previous labor leaders have flirted with the idea of citizens assemblies and constitutional commissions and, and so on, which, which seem to be a much more popular process. This has been very much an, uh, uh, an in party uh, in party process. It does talk about at the end, it talks about having consulted various stakeholders and various people are thanked, but it was obviously quite a closed process through which these proposals were were developed. I think it's much more surprising though that it seems to be a, a relatively I mean I don't it seems to be a relatively non-expert process or at least if experts were consulted, there isn't much evidence of uh, that feeding through into the proposals because I think it's especially some of these things which have been discussed for a long time, you know, um, social and economic rights, you know, entrenching social and economic rights, you know, there's, there's vast amounts that could be said there, but there's nothing in this report, no acknowledgement of, of the problems that it caused. There's a bit of a hint towards the fact that it, it uh, may raise issues for uh, for devolution, but you know, apparent, no apparent uh, realization that there is already a process ongoing in Scotland, which is quite well advanced to um, in incorporate social and economic rights. And, you know, how on earth will any of this stuff um, interact with one another? So I think that's, um, I think that's, it, it is, it's in a very odd report from that point of view. The other thing um, that Meg Hoagley pointed out is that this, this is all badge the stuff that can be done within the first term, all done very quickly. I have scepticism about some of that. But that in itself leads to some of the eclectic nature of, of the report. Some bits of it hang together. The territorial stuff hangs together. Uh, the territorial stuff and the reform of the second chamber is at least linked. But then the stuff on social and economic rights is only very tangentially linked to any of that. And the stuff on standards and public life is not linked at all to any of that. So, you know, why these things and why not other why not other aspects of the constitution? Yeah, the process has been a strange one. Yeah, so we will go very soon to a Q&A. Uh, still a little bit of scope for adding questions if you would like, but just that final question to Meg before we do that. What would your recommendation to the Labour Party be here then? We, we've heard that we have a, a range of proposals. Some of them look potentially quite good. Some of them maybe a bit half-baked. Some of them rather problematic. Um, what, what would you recommend as to what they do now? Well, one thing would be to repeat myself, as I said at the end of my opening remarks, do what you can as quickly as you can. There are things that you can do on the Lords, potentially not even necessarily in the first term or the first year. There are things that you can do in the first week or on the first day, because some of the things that are wrong with the House of Lords can be resolved by the Prime Minister pledging to behave differently. So when the House of Lords Appointments Commission was set up 20 to 23 years ago now, it was on a letter from uh, Tony Blair to the person he was appointing as chair where he set out its terms of reference. Those terms of reference could be widened to require greater quality checking on the party peers, to require there to be a clear formula for how uh, seats are shared out between the parties to require the size of the chamber to be to be brought down so that the prime minister only appoints when there are vacancies. Um, you know that's that's one answer to the question, but I think that on the um, on the more ambitious reforms, I would echo again something that Aileen has said, which is that there just doesn't seem to have been very much account taken of the previous reforms. You know there were we had from 1999 onwards that the there was a Royal Commission report in 2000. The, the, the Labour governments produced five different white papers on the Lords, and then there was another white paper under the coalition and a bill. Uh, and there's no acknowledgement of those proposals. I would take those as a starting point and begin to try and reason what they got right and what they got wrong and where they might need to be amended rather than starting with a blank piece of paper. Because I think that that time showed it is very, very difficult to get agreement. And we were sort of edging in the direction of something that might be in agreement. The Clegg proposals um, in, under the coalition were remarkably similar to the proposals in the final Labour white paper, which was actually produced when Gordon Brown was prime minister. They were almost indistinguishable from each other. 
So you'd think that maybe that was where the consensus could be found, but that seems to have all been thrown away and we've gone back to the drawing board and said, let's have it wholly appointed 200 members, um, no indication of what the electoral system is. So I think just a bit of learning from the past and an incremental approach are the two things that I would recommend. There's also stuff on whether, I, I, I do completely accept that the Brown Commission is trying to do things that hadn't been given adequate consideration perhaps before in terms of really how you could seriously link the devolution settlement to the work of parliament through the second chamber. And these ideas for constitutional entrenchment and so on are very, very interesting, but they're also very difficult and I think you need to look at other countries that have these kinds of arrangements and some of the challenges that they face. And if you look around the world, you find that um, there's a lot of unhappiness and dissatisfaction with second chambers, which are supposed to play a territorial role, even where they are elected on a territorial basis in federal systems and so on. So I think that more lesson learning from other places would be sensible and just a degree of caution and recognition that this is going to be difficult uh, would be refreshing. Very good, thank you. Uh, Akash and Damien, you may well have thoughts on what you would recommend to Labour as well, but um, if you can hold those and weave those into your answers to future questions, let's go now to uh, questions from the audience and Tom Fleming has miraculously appeared on our screens. And um, so Tom, do you want to give us a first round of uh, questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alan. So we've got um, three questions and so I'll invite each of those people in turn to unmute themselves and read out their question. Uh, they'll be from Connell Hopkins, Gareth Williams and Hugh Rawlings in that order. So Connell, would you like to go first with your question, please? Sometimes it takes a little moment to uh, find yeah. people in the list and uh, get them unmuted, but hopefully, yes, uh, Connell, you're able to speak in just a moment. Okay, why don't I read out um, Connell's Why, why don't you do question. that, Tom? Uh, and yes, and then we'll come to Gareth Williams in just a moment. Uh, so Connell's Great. question was, uh, the report mentions a council of UK and nations to pursue shared goals across the UK. How did the panel envisage this council working with the elected upper chamber? And then the question from Gareth Williams. So Gareth, if you would like to um, ask your question. Gareth, we've got you. Do you want to unmute yeah, yourself? Yeah, here I am. Hello. Um, yeah, thanks. Very stimulating discussion. Um, I want to ask the sort of West, West Lothian question, which hasn't really entirely gone away. So in the Commons, Brown proposes an English Grand Committee to scrutinise English-only legislation. But presumably, I'm assuming that amendments made in that committee would be capable of being overridden by the whole house at third reading or whatever because if not doesn't this leave the prospect which is you know has always been problematic from a Labour perspective of a UK government's legislative program being undermined if it doesn't have a majority of English seats and in the new second chamber um, assuming Scotland Wales and Northern Ireland are overrepresented relative to population which I, I think is certainly implied if not stated unequivocally in the in the report does this not disadvantage England despite the fact much of the legislation it will consider will be England only. Wonderful, thank you. And then the last of these, this uh, set of three questions is from Hugh Rawlings. So Hugh, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, given the fact that the report Agreed. says really very little about Wales and literally nothing about Northern Ireland, how can it possibly be said to be a, a pre uh, present a programme of reform for a restructured United Kingdom? Great. Thank you very much. So three questions there. One on the proposed Council of Nations and Regions from Connell. Then on the West Lothian question from Gareth and Wales and Northern Ireland, their absence largely from uh, the report from Hugh Rawlings. Um, no obligation on any of you to attempt to tackle all three of those questions. Akash, the first of those is perhaps closest to your area. So do you want to kick us off? 
Sure. Okay. So this is the question about the IGR, proposed IGR reforms, the Council of Nations and Regions, um, and how it would relate to the upper chamber specifically. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the, the Brown vision is for that particular relationship, other than there is... So, so, so for those unaware, as as uh, Aileen said a little bit about this in her introductory remarks, there's a whole section of the report on a more systematic statutory system for intergovernmental relations, which would include different tiers of intergovernmental body, including, I think the idea is the top uh, level would be known as the Council of Nations and Regions, there'd also be a Council of England, uh, bringing together metro mayors and local leaders with with central government, which is quite interesting, um, and that this yeah this this machinery would play a key role in facilitating cooperation and a new sort of culture of shared governance um, across the UK. Um, I think well, it, it's there's some I think there's some interesting ideas in there, and certainly. Generally speaking, you know, I and, and I think the other panelists broadly would, would share the analysis that intergovernmental relations have been sort of underdeveloped in the UK. That's not an original point. Um, it's good that there's sort of growing attention being paid to the importance of having proper machinery um, that operates sort of independently from the control of any one government um, by which the different bodies can cooperate and resolve disputes and so on. I mean, one of the odd things about the Brown proposals in this area is they don't reflect upon the recent changes that have come about as a result of the review of intergovernmental relations that concluded last year. Um, it's written as if the, the previous system, the Joint Ministerial Committee, is still in operation, which, which is a bit odd. Um, on this specific issue of linking to the upper chamber, from memory, I was just trying to, I don't have it in front of me, but there's a suggestion that there would be, I think, disputes that arose through the Council of Nations and Regions that were not potentially settled at the political level between the governments um, would be looked at by the upper chamber i can't remember the exact formulation but that this would be one of the functions of the upper chamber in its in its new role as guardian of the territorial constitution that it would provide more transparency and scrutiny of of how disputes and, and igr more generally are, are, are being um dealt with right so that's on that specific issue yeah um great thank you very much um Amy? Uh, thanks. So, um, Tos, I'll, I'll address the, the second and third questions. So, so, so on the, the question of the work West Lothian question, I think that's actually is a a really good point. But I think what that indicates is the the limited radicalism of these proposals, and the fact that the starting point is that devolution in England um, will continue to be something very different to devolution in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So you know, the, the existing anomaly um, will, will continue through to, um, to the end of the second change. So I, I, I absolutely take that point. Um, Hugh's point about the absence or virtual absence of Wales and Northern Ireland from the report. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you look at, if you're concentrating on the question of additional powers, but actually there's very little to be said about additional powers for Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in general. That's really not the focus of this um, of, of this report. Um, and kind of ironically, where additional additional powers are proposed, it is really still the kind of shocking list incremental bitty um, approach that the, the the report says shouldn't happen in future. So that's that's all very strange. Where's um where Wales certainly and maybe Northern Ireland, although that's not clear, would be included would be in, in the kind of more general principles. So the, uh, the the new statutory statement of permanence and the new, and the, the and, and full mark two would apply to Wales as well as Scotland. Although it seems not to Northern Ireland, um, I assume 
the subsidiarity principles and uh, solidarity clause and all of those things would, would apply um, across the board. But there is still no attempt to get rid of the anomalies, the other anomalies that you find even between the three devolved nations. And, and as you know, Hugh, these absolutely abound. The minute you try to say anything general about the operation of devolution or the nature of devolved powers, you immediately come in uh, up against the, oh, oh, but it's different in Northern Ireland, or oh, but it's different in Wales, or oh, but it's different in Scotland. You know, it, again, it's pointing to the kind of curious, curiously limited radicalism of this report. It's, it's trying to superimpose a, some radical principles or radical reforms on top of what's already there, which in many respects is already um, is already problematic and, 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 and ripe for reform. So, you know, if, if I were doing this, I would be starting with trying to, to remove the unnecessary anom anomalies in the, in the existing arrangements before then thinking about, well, what else would I want to add to it? Thank you. Um, Meg, is there anything you want to add in this round? That's what those last words from Aileen sounded remarkably like what I said about the Lords. Let's deal with the urgent anomalies before we start getting too ambitious, because the big stuff is difficult. Um, two of those questions touched on, on the second chamber, so I'll maybe say uh, something very brief about both of them. With respect to the Council of the UK and Nations and um, how that fits with the elected second chamber, I think this is a really, really key question. And it is exactly the kind of question that federal second chambers face in many countries around the world, whether they really can do anything to bind together the default, the devolved or the, 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 the sub national bits of the constitution. Because where you have bodies, you know, take Australia, for example, where you've got state governments, you've got state parliaments, and then you've got elected members of the Senate. Um, there's actually no kind of umbilical connection between the elected members of the Senate and the people who are sitting in those state bodies. Um, and so this is a problem which is commonly noted in the literature on second chambers that those kind of connections don't really work. The place where it works is Germany, where the second chamber effectively is an intergovernmental body because it's made up of members of state parliaments, but we clearly can't replicate that because we don't have that kind of arrangement. As Akash says, we've got half of England with no devolution. So how quite how to make those things join up, I think, is a real challenge. And there may be things you can do in terms of having reporting mechanisms from members of the second chamber into the devolved parliaments or that kind of thing. But it's, it's quite a knotty question. Um, Gareth's question about um, the division of seats is also, I think, a really, really knotty one. Um, he assumed in his question that there would be some kind of shift away from pure population based representation, which you do see quite a lot in federal second chambers. But in the past, that really hasn't been countenanced in the UK. So all of those proposals that I referred to before have based the division of seats on population, which, of course, gives very little representation to particularly Wales and even more so Northern Ireland. Whereas if you try to give equal representation, as you do, for example, in the US Senate to the regions of England and the smaller nations, you end up with Northern Ireland getting about three or four times as many seats as it would do on a population basis, which people then begin to think is an overrepresentation of Northern Ireland. So I think that Gareth is pointing towards some real conundrums here, because of course, to have the protection that the smaller nations want, perhaps, or that Brown is trying to give them through the second chamber requires them to be able to win votes. Um, but England is so disproportionately large that that's always going to be difficult. And the crucial thing we need to remember in both of these questions is that members of the second chamber are not going to be some sort of pure regional representatives. They're going to be political party representatives. And how they vote is liable to depend on political party more than anything else. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be a kind of high minded body of constitutionalists who are sitting above political party. It's going to be a partisan chamber. It is now and it will be even more if it's elected. Thank you. Let's go back to Tom for another round of questions. OK, thanks, Alan. So again, we have three questions we'll take in a row here, which are from uh, Tom Brake, uh, Steve Gilmore 
uh, and then Gavin Barker. Um, Gavin asked se several questions, so I was uh, after the second of the questions that you asked, Gavin. So Tom Brake first. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. So um, from the conversations we've been having, as we understand it, the Brown report is, is the end product. And that now what happens is that Labour's national policy forum and manifesto processes take over. So bearing that in mind, what, what do the panellists think uh, is likely to survive the, the, that process or those processes? And if they had to prioritise or wanted Labour to prioritise anything, what out of the very large number of proposals in the Brown Commission report would they want to prioritise? Great stuff, okay. thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah. Tom Fleming, back to you. Yeah, so, and then Steve uh, Gilmore was the second person I've got on my list here. So Steve, if you are still there, would like to ask your question. Right, there we go, sorry. Um, if political stability and the need to achieve consensus on the path of reform are important, as I believe Meg said, at least implied, would Labour do well also to include PR for Westminster elections in its policy proposals? Uh, the most stable polities in the world all use PR and the correlation between PR and consistent long-term policy making, for example, on climate is well established. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Steve. And I can say that uh, that was that question echoed many others that came in from lots of people. So electoral reform, uh, proportional representation and uh, its absence from the report was something lots of people have asked about. Uh, and then the last uh, person on the list for now is Gavin Barker. So, Gavin, if you wanted to uh, ask your question. Oh, we've got Gavin Phillipson. We've got screen. Gavin Phillipson on screen. Uh, so we'll have a question from Gavin Phillipson instead. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> Gavin was later on the list anyway. Um, Gavin, do you want to go for it? Yep, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it was just to, I mean, it's probably primarily for Meg, but um, I really can't see any good rationale at all for the proposal to completely remove the Lord's delay power over ordinary legislation. It's out of line with international practice, which you usually get the lowest is about three months delay. Many second chambers have a total veto. Um, Increasing its legitimacy massively while reducing its powers seems perverse. You'd normally powers would kind of match legitimacy. Um, Jim Gallagher gave a lecture in Edinburgh yesterday that some, some of you may have heard. And when asked about this, he just said, oh, the Parliament Act powers are rarely used, which I thought completely missed the point that their existence forces the government to negotiate and compromise, which many of us think is, you know, is a good thing. And I think just reducing the power of delay, I think I just find, sorry, removing the power of delay completely, I find a completely baffling proposal. I have no idea why that's there. And having looked at it in report, there's no real rationale given. It just says it should be a revising chamber, but current laws is a revising chamber. Great, many thanks, Gavin. Um, and Gavin Barker, if you're there, uh, hold on, be patient, and we will get to you in the next round. Um, Meg, do you want to go first this time? Uh, yeah, fine. Um, thank you. Gavin Phillipson, uh, <laughs> you you put that very bluntly, and um, I, I can't disagree, really. Um, I mean, again, if you're learning from the previous proposals, as I suggested that the Labour Party should want to do, because there were lots of things bashed out over a very long period when Labour was last in power and subsequently, none of those proposals suggested reducing the powers of the House of Lords. Now, I can see, in a sense, the rationale for, despite what Gavin says, which I I, I I have sympathy with. Pragmatically, if you're concerned that by making the second chamber more legitimate, it will become um, it will become more confident to challenge, and that 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 combination of things is going to be off-putting to MPs in approving the reform, which is one of the central things which has prevented reforms in the past. Then, on the one hand, you can see a rationale for saying, "Well, let's weaken the powers," but actually, what you do is you open up a second front for people to disagree with your proposals. And there's enough disagreement on the composition front without opening up the powers front. So, you know, as a political tactic, I think it's a bit of a foolish one. And actually as a constitutional proposal, I think it's a foolish one because I entirely agree with Gavin um, that if you don't have any power that you can threaten to use in the, in the, in the last resort, then it's much more difficult to convince people to listen to you. So it would very, very much weaken the House of Lords and thereby uh, weaken Parliament. Um, 
Okay, maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Aileen? Um, thanks. So, so I, I agree with what Megan Gavin has said about um, removing the, the delaying part. That does seem to be uh, a complete mistake. I, I mean, the, the objection to um, to an elected second chamber is that the, the, the people that are likely to be elected are likely to be less interested in doing the revising work anyway. But if you combine that with the, the lack of any any powers to 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 force your revision to be taken seriously, then it, then it seems to completely undermine that that aspect of the of the Lord's work. Um, on PR, I mean, personally, I I am in favour of PR for the House of Commons. I think it would do quite a lot in itself to reduce territorial conflict. Uh, if that's one of the aims of this report, it would seem to to to, to, to make sense to have done that. But I guess that is something that is seen as being just too difficult. And again, you know, the, the driver of this, uh, the, 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 the eclectic package of proposals as being things that we can do relatively easy, easily in the first term is probably an explanation for why that doesn't, um, that doesn't appear. Uh, what will survive or what would I prioritise? I have no idea what will survive because I have no insight into um, the Labour Party's internal processes. Uh, as I said earlier, the things in relation to the territorial constitution that I personally favour are putting IGR on a strategy basis um, and having another go at, um, at putting Sewell on a strategy basis. But the Sewell proposals are so intimately linked to the reform of the, of the, the second chamber that I am actually quite sceptical about what, whether that will survive because of, of all the reasons that they've given about how difficult it is for um, for meaningful or radical reform in the second chamber to take place. Thanks. Fascinating. Um, Akash, and if you can be reasonably quick, then hopefully we'll fit in a very quick final round. Sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it doesn't... Um, didn't surprise me at all that the report didn't go near the question of electoral reform for the commons hugely contentious within the labor party still of course yeah there are good reasons why 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 it might help to to stabilize uh relations between the nations as as aileen said um i don't think that was ever seen as being within the remit of the this particular commission and I can't imagine they would have found it easy to to reach consensus on it so I imagine just for pragmatic reasons it was it was left out whether or not a Labour Party might still come back to it there's obviously a degree of support within the party more generally um we will see as the as the manifesto gets developed and so on on the other recommendations and and how they will feed into Labour policy um I mean, I think I I I I think in the recent speeches from that I may have mentioned earlier from both Keir Starmer just in early in the new year and Lisa Nandy this week, one gets a sense of the things that the, the elements of the Brown package that have landed and those that are not really um, sort of seen as central by by the Labour leadership. So they're they're definitely committed to a lot of the English devolution continuing the English devolution process, not necessarily in exactly the same way that Brown suggested, no suggestion from or mentioned by Starmer or Nandy of the local bills proposal, for example, but the general thrust of, 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 that, of, of that process continuing and being a central part of a Labour agenda, I think is, is there. Um, a lot of the other stuff on sort of legalization of constitutional principles, Again, we haven't heard much from the Labour leadership that it's definitely going to be in the manifesto. Wouldn't surprise me at all if if they shy away from that stuff. Um, and indeed, you know, there's there's a lot a government can do um, to guarantee the autonomy of of local government, to respect the Sewell Convention, to operate in a more co collaborative, uh, collegiate way without needing to legislate from it by uh, legislate to do that so uh one would hope that an, a labor government might do some of that stuff but it doesn't surprise me if it 
avoids the complication and you know questions of of, of, of legal challenge and so on that would arise if it put it into legislation. Shall I shall I intervene there? And if we're going to go to another round, uh, then uh, we should uh, move to that now. I think. But many many thanks, Akash. Um, Tom, uh, if you've got the questions in front of you, it might be good just to read them out yourself rather than okay. going to people just to just to speak things along a little bit in the final round. Absolutely. So Steph Coulter asked uh, or initially pointed out that the report does not touch on whether the union is a voluntary one and then asked if any of the panellists believe that constitutionalising the secession process as Canada did in 2000 is a viable proposal to clarify what the terms of subnational secession should be and provide greater stability for the union. Um, the next question, whilst I find it, was Stephen Swan, who asked whether a messy variable geometry of devolution in England risked diluting political accountability by giving voters a less clear sense of which bodies are responsible for exercising which powers. Uh, and then Gavin Barker's question, which um, we didn't manage to get in in the last round, was that the speakers have correctly identified gaps, uh, but Gavin asks, isn't the point of the Brown report to trigger a national conversation rather than to cover every issue in concrete detail. Now, we have time for each of you to say one thing very quickly about one of those questions, perhaps. So might I nominate um, Aileen to go with Steph's question on constitutionalizing the secession process. Um, Akash to talk about Stephen's question on messable, messy variable geography, and Meg to go with Gavin's question on triggering um, a bit of a discussion. Aileen. Uh, thanks. So there are there are arguments against constitutionalising secession rights, um, which I think largely don't apply to the UK, partly because we already have constitutionalised social secession rights in relation to Northern Ireland, and partly because we've already kind of sold the past politically in relation to Scotland through the 2014 referendum. So there is an acceptance um, and a, 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 a precedent for the idea of independence being um, being possible. Now, you could have said for quite a long time that there was value in maintaining ambiguity over how exactly the, the independence could come about. But what we've seen is inevitably, I think, that, that some of that ambiguity has been taken away uh, by the Supreme Court's case um, uh, la last year. So we are in a very awkward situation where secession is clearly not legally impossible, but the legal route by which you get to it is, is far from clear. And, and I personally think there would be value in, in trying to clarify that. Having said that, I do recognise that, that, that getting to that process of even agreeing on things like you know, minimum times between referendums uh, who can trigger referendums and in what circumstances, um, electorates and all of that kind of thing, would still be very, very contentious because different parties are, 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 are a long way away from each other on, on, on those particular questions. Akash, you've got Stephen's question on messy variable geography. So does a messy variable geography risk diluting political accountability? I see, yeah. I mean... Yes, I think is the simple answer, short answer. Um, we have a very messy subnational governance landscape in England already. Um, the Conservatives, the government, to some extent, have tried to maybe um, bring a bit more consistency through, for example, the devolution framework they published last year with the levelling up white paper pushing more places to go for a, a male model of leadership but um certainly you know in the devolution deals that have been done so far including in recent months we're not seeing convergence of a single model either in terms of governance or in terms of the powers so there is a lot of messiness labor doesn't seem likely to reverse that if anything it seems likely to, to to allow even more variation. So, yeah, I mean, I do think that's hard for for voters to to understand, and it and it makes it hard to know who's accountable exactly for what. There's no easy solution to it, but it is a problem. I agree. 
And Meg, isn't the point of the Brown Report to trigger a national conversation rather than cover every issue in concrete detail? That's a very nice thought. Um, I And I think that con such a conversation is very welcome and worthwhile having, but I'm not sure that that was Brown's intention. Uh, he seems very... Um, he seems very impatient to get progress on these very ambitious proposals uh, quickly. Um, I do think that there needs to be a serious conversation about them. As I said before, you know, there's a lot, as Aileen has emphasized, there's a lot of detail to think through. And it's also very important to consult widely and bring people on board if you're doing such big things, if they're going to survive and be stable. So I realized that I ducked the question from Tom Brake earlier about the National Policy Forum and what the priorities should be. And I would say that there are lots and lots of, you know, the bigger your package, the more things there are always uh, for people to object to and the harder and harder it gets um, to, to put it through. And I think that the Labour Party is going to be thinking about um, how much political capital to expend on this stuff, given the National Policy Forum is going to be interested in a huge range of other things, um, you know, on the economic front, the social front, etc. Um, so I think what the government needs to do, or what a Labour government would need to do, is focus on what can be achieved, be very pragmatic, deal with the things that you can deal with quickly, ideally the things that you can do without legislation. I mean, for example, on the Sewell Convention, I've said this on the Lords, on the Sewell Convention, the nature of a convention is that it works if people respect it. So if you want to respect the Sewell Convention, just say you're going to respect it and that will do it. And if you want to tighten it up slightly, then why not put it in standing orders that there has to be a vote amongst MPs to approve um, breaching the Sewell Convention? Because actually there isn't even that at the moment. Parliament doesn't have to be asked about the breach. And sometimes just by putting things in front of Parliament, you will find that you create pressure against you know, breaking of those kinds of rules. So I think there's quite a lot that could be done quickly if you're more pragmatic about it. And meanwhile, yes, by all means, let's have that big conversation. Gordon Brown seems to have forgotten. Uh, sorry, that's a bit dismissive. But uh, when Gordon Brown was prime minister, he had big ambitions on constitutional reform. Very few of them were realized because I think when he was in government, he discovered just how difficult it is. And now there seems to be an assumption that this is easy. And I, I, I'm, unfortunately, I really think it isn't. Great, thank you. Uh, this has been wonderful. Before I get to the thanks, a few quick announcements. Um, firstly, the recording of this seminar will appear on our YouTube channel and podcast feed in the coming days. Please do subscribe to those feeds or look out for further information on Twitter uh, for when those will go up. If you're not already signed up to our events mailing list, please do so. Uh, in order to be the first to hear about our forthcoming events. Just follow the Get Involved link on the Constitution Unit's website and you'll be able to get all the uh, links for subscribing. And as I said, we will be publishing details of our February event very soon. As promised, that will be on the question, what does it mean for the UK to be a voluntary union? So we'll be able to get into some of those big questions that Aileen was uh, raising towards the end there. So with that, let me begin by thanking all of you in our audience for attending today, but let me thank especially our fantastic set of speakers who've raised so many important issues here and clearly demonstrated that there's a lot of important work still to be done uh, in these areas over the coming year, months and years, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you so much to Akash Pound, to Aileen McHarg, and to Meg Russell for your contributions today. That's it from us for today. So good afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon.